Thank you so much for the invitation to the meeting. Uh, Sangel Park, your founder, has been a friend since he was a graduate student with CalQuate uh, back at Stanford. Um, my talk today will really be more on the approaches and opportunities side than it will be on the, uh, you know, on uh, focused on data. Uh, what I wanted to do was uh, share with you uh, where we've gone uh, from our initial work for which we're best known of looking at the ultimate limits of miniaturization, the smallest switches and motors in the world, uh, to uh, where we are today and looking at what we can do with uh, the chemical dimension in nanolithography, uh, controlling chemical functionality, and thus interactions with the chemical, physical, and biological worlds uh, through, through uh, techniques and uh, strategies uh, that we developed in our earlier work. And the first person to see uh, the value in our capabilities was uh, Professor Ann Andrews, a neuroscientist, uh, who was my uh, colleague at uh, Penn State and now at uh, UCLA. And what our lab is best known for is developing the scanning probe microscopes uh, that have structure, function, and uh, spectral capabilities all at the same time and are able to measure function on a particular molecule or assembly many tens and hundreds of thousands of times to get statistically significant data so as to be able to pick apart the heterogeneity of those systems. But another capability that we had to develop uh, that, that she saw as potentially useful uh, in uh, biology and medicine was that we'd been able to place uh, chemical functionality in individual molecules and assemblies into controlled environments where we could go from control from even a tenth of an angstrom scale, designing hydrogen bonding interactions between the functional part of our system and the surrounding matrix. And we could do that hierarchically with a combination of, of different techniques all the way out to the centimeter scale. Uh, now that's led us into working uh, sensors with her to look at signaling molecules in the brain, uh, to look at biomarkers, to look at, for instance, uh, phenylalanine uh, sensors for phenylketonurics, and to uh, uh, be able to measure uh, DNA and RNA without amplification, and to look at single nucleotide uh, variations in DNA. I won't uh, have a chance to talk about any of those examples, but I'll refer you uh, to these papers and our many collaborators uh, for that work. I'll uh, give three very brief examples from our work uh, with Steve Jonas, who is a postdoc in the laboratory and is now a colleague in pediatrics, in which we do high throughput cellular therapies, gene editing for hemopoietic stem cells and for immune cells, and appropriate enough with the uh, Nobel Prize last week for CRISPR Cas9. What we've done is used our capabilities to deliver payloads into cells at a billion cells an hour without the uh, safety and cost concerns of viruses and with uh, high viability and efficiency, unlike harsh chemical and physical treatments. So you'll see a little bit of our motivation there and how we got to those systems. And what uh, another uh, side of that coin is doing liquid biopsies, looking at circulating tumor cells and exosomes that are sloughed off from tumors. And I'll refer you to these recent papers and our collaborations with our colleague here, H.R. Tsang and Namjoon Cho at NTU Singapore. Again, I won't have time uh, to talk about that work, but if you're interested, uh, please have a look. Uh, we've also been able to use that uh, ability to control chemical functionality in tissue engineering uh, for periodontal membranes, for artificial bone, uh, for implants, and so forth. And, and uh, sorry, I won't be able to talk about that much today. Now, uh, to uh, serve my role as an evangelist for nanoscience and nanotechnology, and really to talk to the students and postdocs for a moment, at the 10th anniversary of the National Nanotechnology Initiative, and again for Nano Day, which was also uh, just last week, October 9th, and 9, uh, we were asked by the uh, White House uh, a few years ago to say what it is that we had done as a community with over a billion dollars a year in funding for 10 years, and if that funding were to continue, what we would do in the next decade? Well, that seemed like an important question to address. And so we looked in detail and realized, you know, that on the one hand, we were able to make atomically precise structures. And once upon a time, I was the first one to move atoms around with an STM back when I was at IBM with Don Eigler. It was before Don learned to spell IBM. 
I was just trying to figure out what was underneath the atoms on the surface and why they were where they were. The other thing we realized, though, was that even when we have atomically precise structures, so when the switches and motors that I mentioned, if we measure the function of the same system over and over, we get a different answer. And when I say the same system, I don't mean chemically the same system, I mean the actual identical structure. And so that's a whole interesting part uh, to the nanoscale world, particularly important in biology. Again, that's kind of a, a different talk. We realized that the biotechnology revolution had been enabled by new tools. That's kind of the theme of this uh, conference. And that the same thing was true of nanoscience, that we learned to adopt each other's tools, approaches, and problems. And that really read, led to something that was very different that we have in nanoscience and nanotechnology that we didn't previously realize. And that is communication skills that other fields do not, because we came from people from chemistry, physics, biology, medicine, toxicology, neuroscience, engineering, all over, uh, learning to speak each other's language, languages, learning to approach each other's problems. And that has not happened in other fields. And so we feel it's incumbent upon us to show what nanoscience and nanotechnology can do. And that's why we were responsible for the BRAIN initiative. We led the technology roadmap for the microbiome initiative and more. So uh, once upon a time, uh, we had developed a new scanning probe microscope with uh, the capability to uh, measure at microwave frequencies and to measure insulator surfaces with atomic resolution. And we were trying to look for as broad a set of samples as possible. And Dave Valera, our colleague, uh, first at Bell Labs and then at Penn State, this was from his 80th birthday symposium, and Ralph Nuzzo, uh, then at uh, Bell Labs and later at uh, University of Illinois, had put together this alkane thiol on gold self sum monolayer system that we studied. In our very first measurements with the STM, we overthrew the thinking about where the molecules were going, how stable the structures were, and so forth. And that led us to the capability of controlling defects in the monolayers to isolate single molecules, pairs of molecules, lines of molecules, clusters, and so forth. And that's really. Uh, what enabled our work with a scanning tunneling microscope on the switches and motors. And that's where uh, Ann Andrews came in and said, you know, look, you could do this to tether neurotransmitters down on surfaces to do functionally directed proteomics, which molecules interact with those uh, neurotransmitters and to develop the artificial receptors that her team has led to turn around and put on field effect transistors to measure signaling molecules in the brain. And that led us into a biology. At the same time, uh, after we developed all those capabilities, we were also interested in if we could control more complex interfaces than molecules on flat, solid coinage metal surfaces. And of particular interest with the lipid bilayers that make up cell membranes, we came up with new strategies for the placement of the molecules based on curvature. And we knew we needed new techniques to measure. And so we used fluorescence. This was about a 10 year project in our group that we ultimately stopped working on. But the last experiment uh, that we did here was to look at what happened when red blood cells uh, were deformed as they passed through capillaries. This is the work of Dr. Susan Gilmore who's now at NIH. And we found to our surprise that the bilayers opened up and there were transient pores that allowed molecules to pass through the membrane. We didn't know why that was important, but we figured hematologists would. We tried to publish this in the flagship hematology journal, Blood, but three times our manuscript wasn't sent out for review. So we published it in the Journal of Physical Chemistry B and kind of forgot about it until a beautiful experiment came along from uh, Bob Langer, Dan Anderson, and uh, Klaus Jensen at MIT, in which they took cells and passed them through constrictions in microfluidic channels opened up transient pores and were able to deliver payloads into the cells. So at that point, Steve Jonas had finished his MD, PhD, was finishing his residency in pediatric hematology oncology, and he had challenged the group to say, how would you deliver gene editing payloads to a billion cells, hemopoietic stem cells, in an hour so we could treat, for instance, sickle cell patients while they were still sitting in the office rather than taking the cells and sending them off 
to a, a viral facility, waiting a few months for them to come back, and also paying five hundred thousand to two million dollars per dose, uh, and that was uh, prohibitive, both from the safety concerns of uh, insertional mutagenesis and also the cost for three hundred thousand new patients a year. And so we assembled a team of people who do bone marrow transplants and a team of engineers with particular expertise that can be useful. And I'll show you just three examples of where we uh, were able to make this work. And, and the uh, difficulty with the MIT work was that the channels clogged. And so our first question of the group was, how do you make channels not clog? And we came up with several different ways to do that. Uh, this is the basic idea that for a 12 kilogram child, we can basically cure a genetic disease like sickle cell or thalassemias uh, by correcting the DNA in their hemopoietic stem cells and uh, thereby, in the case of those two diseases, enabling them to carry oxygen efficiently uh, with the hemoglobin in those cells. These same ideas work in cancer immunotherapy and we're pursuing those as well, as well as a bunch of uh, immune diseases uh, that are uh, somewhat less known. Okay, so currently uh, the methods are viral transfection, electrocution of the cells to open up holes, but that uh, leads to low viability and uh, something you wouldn't want to do to stem cells. And then harsh chemical treatments that also has efficiency issues. And I mentioned the clogging issue uh, with the cell squeezing approach uh, that had been developed. And so here's where the channels are clogging. Uh, I had done a sabbatical with Joanna Eisenberg at Harvard's Wies Institute, uh, where I still have an appointment. And uh, she and her startup company, uh, which was run by uh, Phil Kim at the time, had developed these omniphobic coatings based on the pitcher plant, uh, which it used to capture insects and rodents. It's a carnivorous plant. And she was able to recapitulate those with slippery liquid infused porous surfaces. And with that approach, we were able to make channels that don't clog and we could run uh, even in single channels, uh, our, our peak efficiency and viability are at about 12 million cells per channel per hour. And so we're able to run that up to with 100 channels, the billion cell per hour uh, uh, milestone that we said we needed. Another way to make an omniphobic surface came from uh, Jason Belling, a student who's just finished his PhD in my laboratory now, who spent a year with Namjoon Cho at NTU Singapore. And what he was able to do was fuse uh, lipid bicells into the channels. And that resulted in the channels not clogging. Again, the sweet spot's about 12 million cells per channel per hour. Uh, we're able to get very high viabilities and uh, quite decent efficiencies out. Uh, this paper just uh, came out online, uh, not yet in an issue. And finally, I'll show one other example, three of the six uh, you get to see, which is inspired by a tokamak in plasma physics, in which we mechanically deform the cells, either running down the center of the channels, and this is a technique pioneered and developed by Tony Wong, who is now a Duke, but had been my colleague and collaborator back at Penn State, was also a UCLA student once upon a time. And we can run that in two different modes, uh, one down the center of the channels and the one that seems to be more efficient, UCLA and Duke being basketball schools, bouncing the cells off a channel wall in which the payloads are electrostatically attached. Once again, we get about 12 million cells per channel per hour. We've multiplexed those, turned this into a startup company, and uh, we've already hit the uh, milestones we need or we said we needed at the start of the process. Uh, we've done this with human hemopoietic stem cells. These are just our first pass on the data. Uh, we've done uh, multiples uh, since then. And then the other side of this they won't have a chance to talk about is using uh, surface functionalization to capture circulating tumor cells and vesicles, exosomes that are sloughed off of cells. Uh, this is work uh, done collaboratively with H.R. Tsang's uh, lab at uh, UCLA. I tried to put everyone's name in every slide as we went and to give you an idea of how we think about surface functionalization as interesting and useful, collecting collaborators across medicine, science, engineering as useful. That's part of the fun of science and particularly nanoscience and nanotechnology, collaborators around the world, the people who paid for everything, especially these foundations that really got us going when two years ago, these were just ideas and we didn't have any data. And you know, I'll, I'll put this up just to, for the end, one of the advantages particularly students and postdocs have is these communication skills that you're learning now are tremendously useful. And you wanna find 
the problems that get you out of bed in the morning. If you look at what Jennifer Dubna said when she won the Nobel Prize last week, that was her driving force, that she just couldn't wait to get in the lab every day. And I suggest that uh, we all choose problems that uh, let us do the same. Uh, thanks so much.